second day of Summer Naturalist Camp. The notes are up. You guys can start writing, and then I'll be right back, and we'll start going through. So, welcome to our second day of Summer Naturalist Camp. You should have all your notes written down at this point. Much to your chagrin and to the disappointment of all, today we have to go through this lesson rather quickly because we have a treat. Guess who's coming to visit today to help us learn about reptiles? Only the most famous herpetologist in Eastern North America as far as rattlesnakes. Not you, copyright. Marty Martin. Marty Martin has been studying rattlesnakes for over 60 years. Don't tell him I told you that. He probably wouldn't want you to know. He actually still runs The Rock and is, well, he kind of puts us all to shame, which is wonderful. I mean, he's phenomenal. But this Bull Run Mountains is his oldest study site. There was a professor, I think at George Mason University, somewhere to the east, that had challenged Marty by saying, I don't, rattlesnakes do not exist in the Bull Run Mountains, and after you meet Marty today, or you spend time with him, or if you've spent time with him in the past, you will soon see that if you tell Marty something cannot be, guess what he's going to do? He's going to go out and prove that it is. And sure enough, he came to the Bull Run Mountains as a youth, he found rattlesnakes, documented rattlesnakes, and really began his career in studying the timber rattlesnakes throughout the whole East. Uh, mainly his study areas are in Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia, but he's done Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake research all the way down in Florida. He studied the rattlesnakes all the way up into New York. And so you get the wonderful privilege to be with him, but he will be here shortly, so we have to go through these notes quickly because Marty is not one to sit around. He's going to want to get us out of the mountain as soon as we possibly can do it. So, that being said, class reptilia. Latin repto. Repto means to creep. And the reason they use that Latin name is <laughs> they creep me up. <laughs> right? No, it's not because they, they do creep out a lot of people. Uh, but it's not because they creep you out. It is because they are mainly ambush predators. So even that copperhead, even though that copperhead does not have appendages, and is actually one of the more advanced reptiles from an evolutionary standpoint, it will slowly move itself into position, which when we feed them at some point, you will get to see that. When the mouse goes into the cage, it uses its pits. Those are actually heat sensors. It can see infrared. And it will slowly get its body creeped up, and then it will form a famous S right as close as it can get. And then just when it's just in the right spot, it strikes. Its fangs come out like syringes, the venom's injected injected, fangs go back in, mouth closed, and it sits back and waits. And the venom is a hemolytic toxin, which means it actually starts to dissolve the tissues. If you ever get bit by a venom mistake, that's what you have to worry about. It will start to dissolve where you got bit, and they pump you up with antibiotics, and they try to deal with the tissue damage. But it's also a neurotoxin. And the neurotoxin causes basically the diaphragm of that mouse first to, to literally not function. And once that diaphragm doesn't function, guess what? I can sing so loud. I'm a terrible singer. I can talk really loud because you use your diaphragm and you speak from where that diaphragm pushes. That way you don't hurt your throat. And you're like, I got that ACDC who lost his vocal cords because he wasn't singing from his diaphragm. I actually don't know the singer of ACDC. But that was a famous Australian band that the guy almost did lose his voice and almost could not. But then I think he finally learned how to sing from his diaphragm. Anyway, once it gets paralyzed, the animal can no longer breathe. Once it can't breathe, it 
and then the snake swallows it whole. They eat all their food whole. They do not chew. Uh, I am going to ask for a volunteer in a minute. For us, we'll volunteer. Good. A snake. Everybody, fill your jaw right here. Feel the bone. Now feel your chin right here. Feel the bone. And then feel your mouth. So what we're first going to do for us is we're going to slit his lips so that they go back like this. And then we're going to take this bone to bone and we're going to like break it apart and we're going to put cartilage there. And then we're going to take his chin and I'm going to go and we're going to put cartilage there. And his bottom jaws and then we're going to be going to go like that. And then with his big lips, cartilage connection heel, that movement with the bottom jaw, it allows them to swallow very large things whole. Uh, so you don't ever have to worry about being bitten by a snake. Uh, just one last thing about the neurotoxin. If you ever did get bit, it's not just the tissue damage, but in order to keep the neurotoxin, it's one of the few wounds that you ever get that, like, I'll say you get a bad cut, you kind of hold it up, reduce the blood flow. Guess what you don't do with a snake bite? You don't hold it up because that would lead the blood flow right down into your heart and your diaphragm. So if you ever get bit by a venomous snake, you actually keep it below so it doesn't spread. But most people get bit by the way, that's not a problem. But just so you remember. Anyway, so the age of the reptiles lasted 160 million years. The first reptile was about 280 million years ago, but they were dominant from 225 to 65 million years ago. And what are the most famous reptiles that have ever been on the planet? What's that huge group of animals called? They were large. Well, the alligators are cool. They have been on chain for like 200 million years. One of the most successful. But what is the large group? Say it. Proud. Come on. Don't just mouth it. They made movies. Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Thank you. Yes, that is the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, and then a meteorite hit, created a ginormous crater, and threw a, a tremendous amount of stuff into the atmosphere, basically affected photosynthesis, which affected everything. And because the dinosaurs were so big, they were so dominant and so successful, but then that largesseness led to them literally starving because if you're at largesse, you have to eat constantly. And if there's not plant life constantly producing for you, it really led to scavengers, teeny little mammals to take advantage of, and the little things that could eat the carcasses, eat the other things, or find smaller food to actually get through that mass extinction of that dinosaurs being so large and needing so much more were unable to do that. And thus, it paved the way really for birds and mammals, which will be what we study tomorrow. Uh, but reptiles, how did they show advancement over amphibians? Amphibians, we talked about yesterday, have a lack of protective skin covering. In fact, if we take the green frog that we saw yesterday out in the stream and we put it in the Walmart parking lot, and then we take a green frog and we skin it and put it in the Walmart parking lot today at noon, they'll both shrivel up at the same rate because they do not have that protection to keep from drying out. Where, if we take a reptile, they do really well. If you do not learn anything about, about amphibians or reptiles this week, understand that when you see that four-legged thing running across your deck in the middle of the summer, and someone says, look at the salamander, could it possibly be a salamander? No, it would dry up, shrivel up. The salamander needs to be in water. So what does it have to be? A lizard. A lizard. Uh, so you can correct all adult units that you ever come across from here on out when they see that thing run across the rock. It can't be a salamander, Mom. It has to be a lizard. Uh, so lizards have protective skin covering in the form of scales. We do have the scales You come in two different forms. <gasps> Just like your skin. Everybody scratch. Stop creating dust in the mountain house. You lose your epidermis and little fanates all the time. The reptiles, some of them lose it in big.
bigger flakes, but like the snake, it loses that epidermis in one piece. We call it a shed. This is the shed of a beautiful rattlesnake from up at the top of the mountains. Uh, that is what we'll be looking for today, in part. They go up into the mountains and the cliffs so that they can hide in the low bush blueberry, which we'll be eating. While we're up there, the berries are delicious. Uh, and we'll make sure that you know so we don't poison you. They hide there so they can be protected after they've eaten, which they've been out for a while, so they've eaten enough. And as they grow, like you, you shed your skin all, all in one piece. They shed or all little pieces constantly as you're growing. And they shed those in one piece. And then once they shed, they go back down. So we'll be looking for pre-shed snakes up in the cliffs. If you see something like this, now I'll take a big pinch of your skin. That is your dermis. That grows with you. A snake's dermis grows with it. This is where the majority of the coloring is. This happens to be the dermis of the copperhead. The copperhead was run over on a road. I picked it up. All the things that you see around us, the red hawk, everything in this building that is not moving is roadkill. We use roadkill all the time. If you want to go in our freezer, you'll see black squirrels and a hummingbird. All sorts of crazy things that sit in our freezer uh, to be able to share. Uh, and once in a blue moon, we take one of those roadkill snakes, take it out of the freezer, let it thaw, and we dissect it. And so when we dissected this one, we pinned the skin and we've kept it to be able to show you the dermis. So if you hear about people having alligator boots or crocodile wallets, uh, they've killed that animal and then used the skin to make it, which we do not promote here. Uh, anyway, more than you ever wanted to know about their skin and how at least the snakes shed. Reptiles have a shelled egg. That's probably the biggest adaptation. And all right, so the amphibians, we talked about having jelly-like eggs. Huge advancement is you take that jelly-like egg, which maybe some of you have been to our sale matter walk and you've seen them, and it's a jelly-like mass that has a little sack around it, which would be actually like the food source for it. And then it has a little teeny dot. And then that grows into the embryo. So there's already sex within both fishes and then amphibians. With the reptiles, it's just simply adding to what already was there as far as sex. First, a leathery shell around all the sacs. Then a sac. The amnion, which you kind of see in the frog egg, with the little snake embryo. Then a big sac to start with, the yolk sac, which provides the food. And then this, what starts off kind of small, a lamp toys. If you eat food, what eventually happens? And we'll get this with the snake when we feed it, because you'll come in the next day and be like, why does the building smell so bad? It's because what happens when you feed? You poo waste. Same with the little embryo of the snake. It puts its waste in the elantois. The elantois also, hot. if you eat food, what do you need in order to consume the energy? To burn it. What do you take in all the time to burn? What? Oxygen. And what do you give out? So, the elantois helps with the gas exchange so it can get the oxygen to burn the food from the oak sap, as well as somewhere to put the waste from burning it, as well as putting the waste, the gas, that comes from burning it. Now you flash forward as the egg develops, what happens? The amnion in the little snake gets much bigger, the yolk sac becomes much smaller, the elantois becomes much bigger, and then all of a sudden the snake's ready to do what? Get out. Get out of its shell and hatch. That led to really the reptiles becoming the first truly terrestrial vertebrates. Now they do not need the water to reproduce. They brought the water and all the juice with them. Uh, and it works really well. And of course, in order to do that, reptiles all have some form of copulatory organ. In fact, in the past, we've actually taken a ball python, which I'll show you in a second, and we looked into the cloaca, and you can sex to see whether they're males or females. We've done that once, I don't plan on doing it again. Uh, but anyway, there's other ways to actually tell their sex without doing that. So that is for maternal fertilization, because of course, if you are going to have a sac system, then this little thing 
the sperm and the egg have to come together first before the sacs are then put around it all in order to then be laid. Now, the rattlesnake and the copperhead, they actually carry the eggs within their bodies. So the other thing we can possibly go see with Marty today is we will go up into the cliffs because what we call gravid females, pregnant females, females that have eggs within them, go up into the cliffs so that they can be under the rock when it's super, super hot, they can come out and be underneath the blueberry bushes when it's that mediocre, or if it's cold, they just come sit out into the sun. And they regulate their body temperature because their ectotherm outside heat, just like the, the amphibians we talked about yesterday, and that way the female gets enough degree warmness, enough warmness to actually have those eggs develop fully so that she can either push the eggs out just before they're about to hatch out of the egg, or sometimes they actually hatch inside her, and then the little guys push up. Uh, and so that's another thing that we'll go up there to study. Uh, last but not least, if you looked at the frogs yesterday and you saw they kind of they're kind of loosey goosey. They rely on it. We talked about this when we were out in the field. Boop. If they eat a big meal, the bullfrog or the green frog that like we saw, you can poke the eyeballs in and see they actually use their eye. They don't have big throat muscles. They go boop. And their jaw system is really based on just not gripping, prying, and holding. The reptile's jaws became much more effective. Uh, for doing things like that. Someone already brought up alligators, crocodiles. The Nile crocodile's jaw is so strong, that's the big one. They can like grab huge African animals and drag it into the water, thrash them, crush them. A square inch, 3,000 pounds of applied pressure per square inch. That's like taking your van, the minivan that you drive around in and putting it on a square inch. That's how much pressure the crocodile can exert. That's how it can grab those. So that's the, the ultimate uh, as far as jaws. To the classification, kingdom animalia. I know, your least favorite group of all living things on the planet. Animals. Phylum chordata. We talked about the chordates yesterday. Subphylum vertebrata. Again, what is a vertebrate? It is a backbone. Backbone. Thank you. Class of reptilian. Order testidines, Latin testidu, tortoise, in England. They generally call all land turtles, tortoises, uh, and they also call the quieters tortoises. Here in the United States, we generally call tortoises the land turtles, except the one land turtle we're going to see out here today is the eastern. What is the kind of turtles at? Completely closes itself in the shell. A box turtle. Thank you. It, the box turtle, uh, we call it a turtle. So that doesn't really stand. Uh, turtles extremely successful. Again, been around sort of like the crocodiles and the alligators, almost unchanged for 200 million years. Uh, very effective. Does limit their size. What are the largest turtles on the planet? Anybody know? Where do they live? They live on an island. You want to see it? Show them. Look at the clock, those tortoises. They're huge. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. 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 Unfortunately for them, the Galapagos Islands are on the co off the coast of Ecuador, which is in South America. right over here. And when you were a whaler, you probably don't know this, or maybe you do. Maybe you read Moby Dick already. Anyway, they'd come from New England, and they whaled out the whole Atlantic, so they'd have to go around the most dangerous Cape, Cape Horn, and if they made it, their first stop, or one of their first stops, would be the Galapagos. And you know why? Because if they made it that far, they pretty much were living without meat. So they would take the Galapagos tortoises, which are huge, long living, they'd put them into the bottom of the ships, upside down, and you think the tortoise could turn itself right side up? No, stuck, but alive. And they would live for months to a year to more. 
and they would just sit there. And then when they really were desperate for meat, they would make turtle soup of it. Yeah, poor turtles. So lots of them were lost during the old whaling days. That's a crazy story, but true. Uh, anyway, so turtles are wonderful animals that you can hopefully we will find the box turtle today. We don't and will not be near the kind of water where we would see painted turtles in some of the aquatics like snapping turtles. The most successful of all the reptiles that you can still see on the planet today are the order squamata, Latin squamata, scaly, ata characterized by. Hey, ata, every time you see that in a word, always you now know that its Latin root means characterized by, so you know the word is descriptive. So when you take your SATs, which you think you're young now, but you'll be taking them before you know it, you remember that ata, and then you can look at those choices, and you can always be like, huh, yeah, ata to characterize by. It has to be a descriptive word. Anyway, squamata, lizards and snakes. We already talked about the snakes. Hopefully we'll see some lizards today. We usually see five-line skinks, broadhead skinks, and fence lizards. Uh, but we will see. And then, of course, our quest. And Marty is just coming up the walk. He just pulled in. We need to grab our gear. We need your water. We need your lunch. We need your snacks. Because we will be out the entire day as we go to study these animals. And so at this point, proceed. Nature calls if nature calls. Ready?